This seminar is for educational purposes only. It is not a substitute for professional medical advice or treatment. Consult with your medical provider for medical advice or treatment. Although the presenters try to keep the information in this seminar as accurate and timely as possible, the speakers and Mather Hospital assume no duty to ensure the seminar is error-free. The speakers and Mather Hospital are not responsible or liable for any claim, loss, or damage resulting from you viewing this seminar. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for our Healthy You webinar series. Today's topic is crafting a heart healthy lifestyle. At any time during the presentation, please feel free to answer any questions you may have using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We will answer as many questions as we can within the time allotted once the presentation concludes. Your questions will remain. <clears throat> Today's presenter is Dr. David Shinuda. Um, all right, let me pull up your PowerPoint, Dr. Shinuda, and I'll let you take it from there. Thanks, John. Great. So thank you, everybody. Welcome. Um, thank you for spending the next hour with me talking about heart disease and heart disease prevention. I'm Dr. David Shinuda. I'm part of Mather Medical Group at Three Village Cardiology, as well as the hospital itself. I'm also the director of cardiac rehab. Um, and I'm very, uh, very privileged to be able to speak with you this afternoon about heart disease uh, prevention and overall um, big picture of heart disease. So next slide, let's get started. So today we're talking about what is heart disease, we're talking about risk factors, talking to your doctor about heart disease, uh, taking action and getting on the road to heart health. Go ahead. So some heart disease facts. Um, so heart disease is the leading cause of death for men and women in the United States uh, amongst almost all racial and ethnic groups. Um, it's estimated that one person dies every 36 seconds in the United States from cardiovascular disease. Um, if you took heart disease and compared it to uh, cancer, uh, all the cancers combined, breast, lung, colon, testicular, pancreatic, um, including the blood cancers, leukemia, lymphoma, uh, combine all of those cancers together and heart disease still kills more Americans uh, every year. And if you combined heart disease with stroke, uh, which is the same uh, pathologic process, then it, there's there's no comparison between the number of deaths caused uh, between heart disease strokes and cancer. Next slide. Heart disease is not just a man's disease. Um, we, we frequently worry about women in heart disease. One in three women will die of a heart attack uh, or stroke uh, each year. Um, this is important to bring up as, you know, February is a recognition of women's uh, heart disease or heart disease women. Um, estimated 43 million women in the United States are affected by cardiovascular disease. Um, and since 1984, more women than men have died each year from heart disease and stroke. Next slide. So let's start with the very basics of the heart. What is the heart? The heart's basically a pump. Um, it's the hardest working muscle of our body. It's pumping about four to five liters of blood every minute while you're at rest. So you can imagine with physical activity that uh, four to five liter cardiac output is gonna go up significantly. Uh, the heart pumps blood to the entire body, supplying nutrients and oxygen um, to every organ that requires it, uh, including the heart itself. So if you look at this little picture on the right, uh, you'll see a, uh, a little animated drawing or a cartoon drawing of the heart. Uh, and you have these arteries on the outside of the heart. So if you imagine the heart sits in your chest like so, on the outside of the heart are arteries that supply muscle with blood. So you have a left coronary artery and a right coronary artery. That's the very, very basics of it. The left coronary artery splits in half as does the right coronary artery, there's also branches. Um, these are the arteries that we're talking about today, which about heart disease, about plaque buildup and narrowing of arteries. Uh, the, the image you see on the, the left, the, the video uh, animated image or moving image, that is an ultrasound of the heart. It's what we call the echocardiogram. So it's very hard to see on this uh, presentation, but basically there are valves that open and close and the muscle itself in the middle uh, squeezes. So as the muscle squeezes, these valves open up 
pushes blood out. Those same valves will close shut as the heart relaxes to fill with blood and other valves will open so blood can get back into the heart. Uh, next slide. So like I said, the heart sits in the middle of the chest. It's pumping blood to the entire body as well as pumping blood to the uh, lungs to get oxygenated. Um, the blood returns back to the body through veins. Uh, and then you can see the zoomed in picture on the right of these coronary arteries and how they branch into small, small vessels. And then those vessels uh, dive into the muscle itself to supply blood flow. Next slide. So over time, plaque can build up. This is what we call coronary heart disease or coronary artery disease. Um, so fatty deposits that we call plaque or atherosclerosis uh, will allow for cholesterol and fat to basically bury itself into the blood vessel wall. Uh, when this occurs, the blood vessel wall itself becomes you know, more and more uh, thickened and it causes the middle of the blood vessel wall, or the blood vessel to become narrowed. So that middle part, you know, the hole, that's what we call the lumen, L-U-M-E-N. When the lumen becomes more and more narrowed, now you've got restriction of blood flow and therefore the muscle does not get the blood flow it needs, usually with activity. So when your cardiac output needs to go up, uh, the demand for blood flow increases to the muscle. So when you've got restriction of flow because of all this plaque, then you're gonna have limitation and the heart muscle is gonna start starving for those oxygen and nutrients. Next slide. So here you can see um, that the plaque has built up so much so to the point that it has obstructed flow. Um, so heart attacks and stroke result from a reduced blood supply to the heart and respectively the brain. So like I thought, that's why I was saying earlier, it's the same you know, a pathophysiologic process of plaque building up in the arteries. Next slide. So what are signs and symptoms of heart disease? So let me just clarify, when I say heart disease, I'm talking about obstructive heart disease, right? So there's so much plaque buildup that the blood vessel is not supplying enough blood to the heart muscle. Now you can have non-obstructive plaque buildup and therefore that would not cause symptoms. But the symptoms that we do look out for obviously are chest pain, pressure, heaviness, uh, usually described as a heavy weight on the chest. An elephant on the chest is the uh, prototypical description. Um, you can get unusual upper body discomfort. You feel like arrows going through your chest to your back. Um, you can be very short of breath, you know, profoundly winded. You try and climb a flight of stairs and you just can't catch your breath. Um, you can become very diaphoretic. You break out in a cold sweat uh, with physical activity, um, or you can get suddenly lightheaded and dizzy, like you're going to faint or pass out. Unexplained nausea, especially if you're climbing a flight of stairs or physical activity, you feel like you want to vomit. That's, uh, you know, a red flag that most people don't often think about. And then if you have significant plaque buildup and it's fairly diffuse and gradual in its occurrence, uh, you can feel just profound fatigue or tiredness, uh, inability to do things that you would normally have no problems doing. Uh, next slide. So how do we fix this? Well, you know, the more common method we have nowadays is what we call angioplasty or balloons or stents. So you can see in the top right and bottom right pictures, um, these are doctors in a cardiac catheterization lab. Um, and so they're basically advancing catheters into the body uh, from the artery in the wrist called the radial artery. And then the catheter advances up the radial artery past the brachial artery into the aorta. Uh, and then we're inserting that catheter directly into the beginning of that coronary artery that we saw earlier, supplying blood on the outside of the heart muscle. Uh, conversely, if we can't go through the wrist because somebody has had prior uh, surgery there, or they have an anatomical uh, abnormality, then we can go through the groin through the femoral artery. Uh, we prefer to do the wrist because there's less um, risk of complications, there's less chance of bleeding, there's less chance of vascular injury, uh, and also people can get up and walk around immediately after the procedure, whereas if we go through the groin and the femoral artery, they have to be laying down for about four hours afterwards, which can be quite uncomfortable, uh, especially if you want to, you know, go to the bathroom, etc. Uh, next slide. 
So this is a, a little animation or a little uh, diagram showing what these stents look like and how they're inserted. So if you look to see the, the top uh, a ca cartoon here, you've got significant plaque buildup and we advance a little uh, wire through the plaque um, to see how much narrowing there is along with the dye that, or the contrast agent that's injected. Um, we then, once we see where the narrowing is, we go back in with a uh, deflated balloon and stent. So you can see that in the second picture. Um, and then the third picture, you see the balloon gets inflated. So we have uh, an inflation device um, that's named an inflation device, which is, you know, very, uh, very witty. Uh, goes in and we inflate the uh, balloon. And this, as the balloon inflates, it pushes that stent open and the stent expands. And then when we deflate the balloon, that expanded stent stays in position and keeps that blood vessel open and prevents it from collapsing again. Um, so that stent is now inside the body and it does not come out ever. It's part of the body. Um, over time, it's gonna get endothelialized, which means that the lining of the blood vessel wall will grow over that stent and it'll become part of the blood vessel wall. Next slide. So here's a little animation of a catheter sitting in front of the coronary artery. So imagine this is a person who's laying down on that big x-ray table that we saw earlier. And there's a cardiologist there by their wrist um, standing over them with these screens. So on the screens in front of them, we will see um, the catheter coming in front of the coronary artery. We inject dye or contrast. And you can see the contrast fills the artery, but then stops rather abrupt, abruptly and doesn't go any further. John, you can put it to the next uh, video. So then we able to put a wire and a balloon, like I was talking about, we inflate this balloon and you can see there's little markers on there so we can see these radio opaque markers where the beginning of the balloon is, where the end of the balloon is. And we inflate the balloon in the area of that blockage or narrowing. And then with that, the stent is deployed in the same area. And then we go back and we now insert the dye, insert the contrast. Again, you can see how well it fills the artery. So this is an excellent result um, of a stent being deployed properly and relieving or alleviating uh, some significant obstruction. Now the name you see there, Louis Gruberg, that is not the name of the patient, that would be a HIPAA violation. Louis Gruberg is the head of our cath lab here at Mather Hospital. He's the director of the cath lab and he's the operator of this procedure, this specific procedure here. So kudos to him for doing a wonderful job. Next slide, John. Good. So what are the risk factors for heart disease and what are the risks? And there are several risks involved. Um, these are the risks that we call modifiable risks or risks that can be changed. So high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, obesity, physical inactivity, and smoking. Um, physical acti inactivity, um, I would say, is um, not a major risk factor, but certainly uh, it attributes for a significant amount of heart disease. Um, risk factors that cannot be changed. Next slide. Yeah, risk factors that cannot be changed your age, um, your sex at birth. That cannot be changed. It can be changed, but at birth is still at birth. Um, your ethnicity. Um, your family history, so your genes, we can't change those. Those are what they are. Um, and if you have any prior history of heart disease or prior stroke, uh, once something like that has occurred, um, that cannot be altered. Next slide. So what we do is we focus on those things that can be changed to modify them as best we can. So lowering risk for heart disease can occur by as much as 82%. Um, there's a multiplier effect. So if you have one risk factor, your risk doubles. Uh, two risk factors, you quadruple your risk, three risk factors, uh, more than tenfold. Um, so by reducing or affecting four um, things, you know, eating right, being more physically active, not smoking, and keeping a heart healthy weight, you can lower your risk of heart disease by as much as 82%. So the more things that you try and modify and tackle, the better. Next slide. So risk factors for a high blood pressure, aside from heart disease. Um, being older, as we all get older, our risk factors for our risk for high blood pressure, primary hypertension increases. Uh, ethnicity of being African descent or African Caribbean or Caribbean descent 
increase your risk for high blood pressure significantly more so than any other ethnicity. Um, having a strong family history of hypertension uh, will increase your risk for developing hypertension. Um, being overweight and obese will increase your risk for high blood pressure as well as high alcohol intake. And last, I would add on to that, which is probably a combination of uh, overweight and obesity, but obstructive, obstructive sleep apnea will also increase your risk for high blood pressure. Next slide. And then we see here a high body mass index, body mass index, excuse me, which is um, obesity or being overweight will increase your blood pressure by about 15 millimeters of mercury, significant alcohol intake by about eight millimeters of mercury, high sodium diet and a low potassium diet um, will increase blood pressure by about five millimeters of mercury each. Um, and a low fiber diet or a high fat diet will also increase blood pressure as will physical inactivity. Stress, we don't have a definitive number on because it's, it's a variable uh, figure. So that measurement of high blood pressure uh, will go up and down proportional to stress and temporarily speaking with stress. So as stress subsides, your blood pressure may be back to uh, normal. Uh, next slide. So if you look at stroke rates uh, based on blood pressure, you can see that as the blood pressure becomes uh, higher and higher, there is an exponential uh, curve um, to the risk of stroke, which is why over the years, uh, the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association have become much more aggressive with trying to lower our blood pressure targets. So previously we'd say, oh, as long as your blood pressure is, you know, less than 140 over 90, um, you're okay. Uh, now our goal is 120 over 80. Uh, we want to keep your blood pressure less than, excuse me, less than 130 over 80. Uh, because you know that as your blood pressure goes up higher and higher, your risk for stroke increases. Certainly if you have other risk factors like diabetes um, or prior uh, cardiovascular or cerebrovascular events, then we want to aim for a much lower uh, blood pressure target than just the 130 over uh, 130 over uh, 80 threshold. Next slide. So hypertension or high blood pressure, if not uh, treated properly, will increase the risk uh, to the end organs. And the four main end organs uh, include the heart, the brain, the kidneys, and your peripheral arterials. Um, I would also include in that your eyes. Um, hypertensive retinopathy is uh, not uncommon. Uh, and if blood pressure is not well controlled, you can get uh, significant visual uh, disturbances. Um, but in terms of the heart, you can get uh, chest pain, maybe stable angina or unstable angina, cause a heart attack. Um, people can develop congestive heart failure, which is the more uh, common uh, finding with uncontrolled high blood pressure and the heart. Um, ischemic events or compromised blood flow to the brain is uh, unfortunately common with high blood pressure, as is chronic kidney disease or renal vascular disease. Uh, and lastly, in your peripheral arterioles, we worry about claudication and aneurysm. So lack of blood flow to the legs, especially with activity, um, as well as too much uh, pressure on the arteries can cause more wall stress and that wall stress will cause or can increase risk of an aneurysm forming. Uh, next slide. So the things you can do to <clears throat> reduce your blood pressure, um, weight reduction, adopting a DASH eating plan, which is dietary approaches to stop hypertension. I highly recommend this to every one of my patients. <clears throat> which is not just reducing your sodium, but increasing your dietary potassium, uh, increasing your diet with more fruits and vegetables and whole grains, <clears throat> excuse me, less, uh, less processed foods, uh, increasing your physical activity level and reducing your alcohol consumption. All of these will help to lower your blood pressure. Next slide. And that's without medication. That's purely lifestyle modifications. Um, we talked about plaque buildup and cholesterol. So cholesterol, as you probably know, is a waxy substance in your bloodstream that um, is necessary for your body to function properly. However, too much cholesterol, <clears throat> excuse me, circulating in the blood 
uh, can slowly build up inside the walls. So basically, depending on the type of cholesterol and the particle size, um, the cholesterol can dive into the blood vessel wall itself and cause uh, significant uh, plaque buildup and formation. Next slide. So where does cholesterol come from? Um, you know, the rule of thumb is 60-40. In this, in this slide, it's 65-35, but 60-40 is basically 60% 60 of the circulating cholesterol in your body comes from the liver and other cells throughout your body producing cholesterol by the body itself. And about 40% comes from your gastrointestinal tract, your digestive system. Uh, and that comes from the food you eat. So the more saturated fat you consume, um, the more cholesterol and low density like proteins you're going to uh, create. Um, however, for some people, regardless of what they eat and how much cholesterol they take in, uh, their genetics and their dietary makeup will predispose them uh, to making more bad cholesterol by way of the liver. Next slide. So LDL or low density light protein is known as the bad cholesterol. This has a tendency to increase risk of heart disease. Uh, and certainly there are uh, different types of LDL. So, you know, if you're not sure if you have the, you know, the very unhealthy LDL or the average LDL, certainly talk with your, your doctor or a cardiologist about the different types of LDL that uh, exist in the body and what you, uh, what your makeup is. HDL, we call it the good cholesterol. HDL stands for high density lipoprotein. An easy way to remember um, this is L for lazy and H for healthy. So the LDL is the bad cholesterol. The HDL is the good cholesterol. There are other cholesterol subtypes that we can talk about, specifically apolipoprotein B and lipoprotein little a. Those we tend to see more with genetic uh, hyperlipidemia issues. Uh, and those are things that if you have a family history of heart disease, you should ask your a cardiologist or your doctor to um, uh, do those assays. Next slide. So for the most part, as Americans, uh, most American uh, kids, adults have too much cholesterol in their blood without even knowing it. About 25% of the cholesterol comes directly from what you eat. We think that's probably higher to uh, 30 or 35%. So we have a lot of control of the cholesterol. Um, choosing foods that are low in saturated fat and trans fats, uh, as well as high in whole grains will help to lower your uh, circulating cholesterol levels. Um, the other thing we know is that the uh, process of plaque buildup or the pathophysiologic process of plaque buildup um, occurs you know, early on in life. We know from, unfortunately, from uh, population data, autopsy data, uh, back in the 70s of children having autopsies after being in unfortunate uh, accidents, maybe bicycle accidents or car accidents or swimming accidents. Uh, it used to be in the 70s that we routinely do autopsies on uh, patients uh, for scientific uh, education research, and that still exists today. Um, but we know from the 70s, a, a big birth of data came out showing that uh, even teenagers had plaque buildup in the arteries of the heart. And we call them fatty streaks. They look like lines basically in the blood vessel wall uh, of young uh, teenagers' uh, aortas. And so those fatty streaks are not a normal part of aging that is related to too much high uh, cholesterol circulating in the blood circulation. So the, the sooner a person identifies the uh, the downfalls of high cholesterol in their diet, the sooner they can take action and the sooner um, they can prevent that plaque from forming and building with time. Next slide. So there's 10% reduction uh, of blood cholesterol uh, can cause about 20 to 30% decline in uh, cardiovascular heart disease deaths. So all adults over 20 years of age should be tested. Um, if normal, they should get tested again after five years. If elevated, they should work towards normalizing levels and probably check their cholesterol either annually or um, semi-annually. Um, and, you know, if you're going to be doing lifestyle modification, uh, specifically, you know, a low cholesterol, uh, high fiber, high animal protein, uh, no processed food diet, 
you want to give that at least six to nine months to take effect before um, seeing, you know, maximal cholesterol numbers. And certainly if you're on medications, you should have your cholesterol and uh, other things like your liver enzymes checked probably twice a year, every six months. Next slide. So about 80% of cardiac events may be stents, angina, unstable angina, can be prevented with education and lifestyle changes. So the important thing is to know your numbers, following a healthy diet uh, and exercise, and practicing stress reduction and um, being mindful practice of how you eat and how you approach things. Next slide. So these are the proven dietary patterns that have been shown to help reduce heart disease. So there's a Mediterranean diet, uh, there's also a portfolio diet or the DASH diet, which I spoke about earlier, which is the dietary approaches to stop hypertension. Um, the DASH diet was developed by uh, the NIH and has a tremendous amount of uh, real data showing the improvement, not just with weight loss, but in quality of life, as well as reduced heart disease. Now, we can't say the same thing about other diets and specifically, you know, the keto diet or the Atkins diet or the South Beach diet in terms of heart disease. We can say that those diets may help people um, re reduce their weight and drop some pounds, but oftentimes those diets do not help people stay off those pounds long-term. They tend to have yo-yo uh, fluctuations in their weight because these diets usually are not sustainable or because even if they are sustainable, um, the body has mechanisms built in to help account for the fact that, you know, you have a zero carb diet and okay, you, you were ketotic before, but now the body recognizes that you're not taking any carbs. So it's going to start building fat uh, stores because of the excess fat that you're consuming, taking in. Um, dietary patterns that are high in uh, nuts, legumes, uh, unsaturated oils, such as olive oil or avocado oil, as well as increasing your fiber and whole grains um, has been shown uh, consistently to lower heart disease risk. And of course, low glycemic load or glycemic index dietary patterns, which means uh, no concentrated sweets and reducing your simple carbohydrates uh, as much as possible. Vegetarian dietary patterns are also uh, strongly correlated with reduced heart disease. Uh, and some would, some studies have actually shown that pescatarian diets uh, are similar, but are not anywhere near as strongly correlated with low heart disease risk. So um, people would ask, you know, if I want to reduce my chances of heart disease because of my family history, what can I do? And the, the uniform answer is a whole food, mostly plant-based diet. Um, so whole food is not the store. Whole food is foods that are not processed foods that you buy as a whole item and you prepare them yourself, you cook them yourself, or you buy them after somebody else has recently prepared and cooked them from a whole uh, item, as opposed to processed foods, which are made in a factory somewhere, you know, weeks and months before you consume it. So there, uh, that could include uh, packaged breads, uh, crackers, um, and certainly, you know, processed meats are, are, are a big uh, red flag for increasing cardiovascular uh, risk. Next slide. So heart disease prevention here, I always find this to be uh, uh, a cute little slide. I'm prescribing patch to help you quit smoking. Wear it over your mouth. Um, quitting smoking, uh, while I joke, is one of the hardest things that a person can do. Um, over 50% of people who suffer heart attacks are smokers or former smokers. Um, after you quit smoking for five to, to eight years, usually we think that the risk of heart disease now comes back down to your risk as if you were not a smoker. Um, that doesn't say the same thing for the risk of lung disease, maybe COPD, emphysema, or chronic bronchitis. Um, and the risk for lung cancer certainly is something to be concerned about as well. Next slide. So controlling your weight, um, excess weight can increase risk for heart disease. We, we know that, we talked about that as well. Uh, that does not mean that people who are, um, who are overweight um, 
don't necessarily have good cholesterol numbers or are not heart or not healthy. You can certainly um, be overweight and still have a significantly lower risk for heart disease than somebody who is, you know, has a good body mass index, but they smoke or they eat concentrated sweets um, and or their cholesterol numbers are sky high. So this is just keep in mind, it's just one risk factor out of all the other risk factors we're talking about. So lowering your weight will reduce your risk for heart disease. Um, next slide. Knowing your family history is important. Um, you are at increased risk if you have a very close relative. So a first, first degree relative, which means mother, father, brothers, or sisters, right? Those are your first degree relatives. If they have a, a history of having heart, having had heart disease before age 55 for the men and before age 65 for the women, that increases your risk for heart disease. Now, does that mean that if your, you know, your dad's brother had a heart attack at age 40, that, that does not increase your risk? No, it may increase risk, but it may not be significant enough because the, you know, that uncle that you had, his genes are now um, diluted by the genes of um, your mother, as well as um, not being a direct genetic match as your father. Um, so again, uh, first degree relative with heart disease before 55 for men and 65 for women, will increase your risk for heart disease and means that you should be a little more aggressive and looking for your cholesterol numbers and your blood pressure and your weight. Next slide. So dietary measures, again, minimizing your trans fat, saturated fat intake. Um, these are often found in prepackaged baked goods that have long shelf lives. Next slide. Eating whole grains. Uh, eating whole grain cereal seven or more times per week has been shown to reduce heart disease risk. Uh, eating whole grains has also been shown to reduce your risk for uh, colon cancer as well as other GI uh, illnesses. Next slide. And high fiber as well. Uh, low glycemic index, high fiber foods will decrease cholesterol and control blood sugar levels uh, more consistently than other diets. Next slide. And so exercise, you should have about 30 to, 45, 30 to 45 minutes of cardio exercise about six times a week, in addition to strength training to build muscle and reduce body fat. I would also add that uh, strength training in addition to cardiovascular exercise also helps to increase bone density and reduce likelihood of osteoporosis. Uh, it also helps to stabilize joints uh, and reduce the risk of herniated discs as well as uh, large joint injuries like knee or hip injuries. Um, regular cardiovascular exercise will reduce the incidence of obesity. Uh, it'll increase your HDL and can lower your LDL. So increasing that good cholesterol and lowering that L lazy bad cholesterol. It will also help to control diabetes and hypertension by increasing insulin sensitivity in the muscle. Next slide. And reducing your stress intake. So reducing stress and relaxation um, will help to lower blood pressure, help to reduce your cortisol levels, your stress levels, and that in part helps reduce your risk for heart disease. So doing something like yoga, meditation, deep breathing, uh, or even just laughing with family and friends, that has been consistently shown to be a benefit. Next slide. And of course, sleep. Eight hours of sleep a night has been the number that we often uh, attribute to increasing um, heart health and reducing uh, cardiovascular disease. Um, on the other hand, if you're sleeping you know, 12 plus hours a day, that may increase risk for cardiovascular disease, but that's a whole other uh, conversation. Um, so part of that eight hours of sleep, it's important to make sure that it's uh, functional sleep, right? it's, it's healthy sleep. So oftentimes we ask patients about um, their sleep hygiene, um, how well they feel in the morning. Do they feel rested? How many hours of sleep do they get? Are they waking up frequently through the night? Are they waking up to urinate or are they waking up and then urinating? Um, in other words, is, is the reason why you woke up because you had to urinate or are you urinating because you woke up? And oftentimes people are waking up in the middle of the night because of sleep apnea. So obstructive sleep apnea is not uncommon. 
Um, I'm sure many of you uh, watching this webinar probably have friends who've heard of friends who use a CPAP machine. Um, that is not the only way to sleep, treat sleep apnea. Uh, oftentimes people who have sleep apnea may be able to uh, simply have an oral appliance. So basically a bite card or a mouthpiece that they can put in their mouth to help keep their jaw forward and prevent their airway from obstructing while they sleep. Um, some people use breathe right strips. So basically little strips that go over the bridge of the nose to keep um, the airflow uh, positive. And, and th those are helpful for people who have mild apnea. If you have more significant uh, sleep apnea, moderate or severe obstructive sleep apnea, uh, or if you have times where your oxygen levels are dropping significantly while you sleep, then more than likely you would probably benefit from a CPAP machine, which is continuous positive airway pressure. Uh, there are other ways of treating as well, um, but that's a, a, a much larger discussion. Next slide. So getting screened, talking to your doctor about your risk for heart disease, um, knowing your family history, knowing your blood pressure numbers, knowing your cholesterol numbers, asking about those uh, other subtypes of lipid proteins. So maybe lipoprotein little a or apolipoprotein B, or asking if you have vascular inflammation by doing a test called a C-reactive protein. These are all different ways we have of measuring somebody's risk for heart disease. Now, with that said, once you know your risk, the important thing is, well, what do you do with that information? Do you just know your risk and accept it for what it is? Or do you take action by uh, eating a heart healthy diet, beginning exercising, losing some weight, quitting smoking, getting more sleep, doing meditative or yoga uh, techniques or relaxation techniques? Or what we find as cardiologists to be most, most impactful is taking medication. So if your blood pressure is high or your cholesterol numbers are high, then you have to acknowledge that they may not get to normal with just these preventive measures alone. You might need actual treatment. So you might need cholesterol medication, maybe statins or otherwise. Next slide. So start with the most basics, which is just get out there, walk, be active. And like I said, talking to your doctor. Next slide. I believe that's the last one. Awesome. Thank you uh, so much, Dr. Shenouda, for your uh, very informative presentation. If anybody has oh, any pleasure. questions, uh, you can enter them in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Uh, all your questions will be anonymous to protect your privacy. So, so I, I do see a question here. Um, somebody had mentioned that they are out of breath uh, when walking on incline or stairs. Um, and their risks only include being overweight. Is this a risk for heart disease? Um, no pain or anything else of significance. So uh, great question. Um, you know, if you're having shortness of breath going upstairs or inclines as opposed to flat level ground, that means that it can be one of, it could be one of several things. Um, the easiest thing to say is, oh, just because I'm, you know, deconditioned, I'm out of shape and, or I'm overweight, and I'm carrying on, you know, an extra 40 pounds. And that's why. Yeah, but it may also be the beginnings of heart disease, yes. So heart disease can manifest as being shorter breath with physical activity, more so than just light level work. So it's important to talk to your doctor and get screened, um, not just looking at your risk factors, but if you're having symptoms like that, then you should probably have a stress test or a CAT scan uh, of the heart. Um, there are CAT scans that we have available of the heart now, which look at the arteries directly to see if you have significant plaque buildup and restriction of flow. So I hope that helps, but definitely, talk with your doctor or see a cardiologist um, to get tested, especially if you're having symptoms. Um, next uh, person says, when I shop for bread, it will say whole grain bread, but actually it's not whole grain. Can you tell us what brand of bread is healthiest? So I can't tell you what brand of bread is healthiest, but I can tell you that if you're looking for bread that is uh, whole grain or multigrain, you want to look specific and you want to uh, get a better sense of um, is it truly whole grain uh, or is it a uh, refined or a simplified green? So what I mean by that is if you look at white flour, for example, white flour has the coating of the, the grain itself, right? So the grain is, uh, if you picture a stalk of wheat, right? You've got all these little grains on there. Uh, on the outside of that uh, kernel or grain is a protective coating. That's called the bran, B-R-A-N. 
Bran uh, surrounds the, the grain, and in the middle you have the pulp of the grain. That's where all the carbohydrates are. So white flour um, is basically a whole grain that's been ground down through large you know, stone wheels to the point that all that bran is stripped off and all you left with is the pulp in the middle, that white pulp, which becomes white flour. Um, so you want to find bread that doesn't have that uh, pulp, uh, sorry, the bran completely stripped off. You want to have a whole grain uh, bread or uh, pasta or whatever it is. So it could be whole wheat or it could be multigrain or seven grain, but specifically what brand, I, that I couldn't say. Um, we do have a dietitian uh, at Three Village Cardiology. Her name is Catherine. She is fantastic in terms of giving people specific advice about uh, dietary um, dietary choices to make. Um, you know, I can give you a, a rough overview as a cardiologist, but, you know, I'm not a registered dietitian. I don't have the uh, insight as much as somebody who has gone through, you know, specific schooling for that. But yes, multigrain or whole grain bread is what you probably look for. The brand, not sure. Um, how much saturated fat per day if you already have some coronary artery disease? So as little as possible in terms of saturated fat. You want to have most of your dietary fat intake, intake as uh, unsaturated fat or polyunsaturated fat. So as, as little as possible um, would be my uh, suggestion. I know that's not a specific number, and I apologize for that, but again, as little as possible uh, for that. Uh, any known connections between COVID and developing heart disease? Yes, there are. Um, in fact, we know that a lot of uh, viruses, not just COVID, uh, do increase your risk uh, for vascular inflammation and can thereby increase your risk for uh, vascular injury. So... COVID and uh, other viruses specifically will not cause plaque buildup per se, but if there's plaque buildup there, uh, the inflammation, the vascular inflammation that you can see with COVID and other viruses can cause that plaque to rupture. What I mean by that is if this is that, that blood vessel we're talking about, the pipe, and there's a little plaque lining the wall here, if that plaque breaks open, the contents of that plaque, that fat-filled uh, layer of cholesterol will spill out into the blood circulation and a blood clot can then form and cause uh, a sudden obstruction of flow. And so yes, COVID can cause inflammation, vascular inflammation, and you can get plaque rupture and uh, a heart attack from that. Uh, so somebody here, next question says, I was recently diagnosed with high cholesterol uh, and they now take a statin to control it. Uh, they noticed the other day that their fish oil pills, which they have daily, um, have 10 milligrams of cholesterol in them. Should I stop taking the fish oil? So I guess the answer is it depends on why you're taking the fish oil. If you're taking the fish oil to lower triglycerides, then I would talk to your doctor about prescription uh, fish oil. And it's not fish oil. It's actually omega-3 fatty acids that are sterified. So you're getting just the good part of the fish oil, the omega-3. So you're not getting cholesterol, you're not getting saturated fat, and you're not getting any other uh, byproducts that can come with, um, with fish oil, especially the over-the-counter fish oil uh, or the fish oil that just gives you a, a total uh, value. So it may say, you know, 1,200 milligrams of fish oil. Okay, but what's the breakdown of DEA and EPA and AHA? I mean, you want to know the specific amounts. And so therefore, you're probably much better off having prescription omega-3s, uh, which are uh, generic now. They're, they, they're not costing you more. Um, but if you're not taking them for a lower, lower triglyceride, you're just taking them just to take them, then I would say don't take them because the, the benefit that you get from fish oil is not that great if your triglycerides are normal. Um, and the adverse effects you can get from over-the-counter fish oil uh, are not trivial. I mean, they can cause a lot of gastrointestinal disturbances, a lot of diarrhea, um, belching, reflux, indigestion. So I would be careful with the over-the-counter fish oils. Um, if you're taking them to help lower cholesterol and you're already taking a statin, then that fish oil is going to have very limited benefit. It's kind of like if you're driving your car and you wanted to, you know, you want to go faster, um, you can check your tire pressures and make sure that they're inflated properly, or you can put in a larger engine. If you put in a larger engine, then checking tire pressure isn't going to make a difference. You already, the benefit you get from that larger engine totally, totally outweighs any benefit you're going to get from the tire pressure. 
Um, and it's probably not a very good analogy. What I mean by that is if you're already taking a medicine like Lipitor or Crestor or Zocor, the benefit you get from that is so dramatic that whatever benefit you may get from a fish oil is much, much lower that it's completely overshadowed by the statin medication. But if you're not on a statin, yes, taking a fish oil, uh, specifically prescription fish oil, will help to lower your uh, cholesterol and triglycerides. Um, next person asks the question of, if blockages are in the coronary arteries, are blockages likely to exist in the brain also? And so, yes, that's a great question. And that's what I was trying to say in the beginning, and I probably wasn't as clear, but basically um, the plaque buildup in the arteries are gonna occur in every artery of the body, may occur in every part of the body. So if you already have plaque buildup in the arteries of the heart, chances are you probably have some plaque buildup in the arteries in your neck, the carotid arteries going up to the brain, to your cranial arteries. Um, so if you, if you have plaque here, super important to be aggressive with uh, the medications and the lifestyle changes to help reduce the likelihood of that plaque uh, from developing uh, elsewhere in the body, specifically the brain and the legs. Um, looks like there's one last question. And the question is, do egg yolks increase your cholesterol? Absolutely. Um, egg yolks are completely filled with cholesterol and saturated fat. The protein that you get from an egg all comes from the egg white. So if you're looking to increase your dietary protein, then the egg whites are great. Um, and the egg yolks are basically extra cholesterol and saturated fat. So that's why we tell people to avoid egg yolks and have egg whites only. <clears throat> Excuse me. With that said, ideally would be to avoid the egg altogether and limit your amount of animal protein intake because that will reduce your risk for heart disease. However, I understand not everybody is a vegetarian or a vegan and people are going to have uh, poultry. They're going to have uh, animal proteins. And so if you're going to do that, yeah, then avoid the egg yolks and stick with the egg whites. Or you can do, I forget the, the exact uh, name for it. It's basically if you take, uh, if you have three eggs, um, you can basically have uh, three egg whites and just one of the yolks. So two of the yolks, you throw them away when you're making your omelet or whatever you're making. Uh, and you just keep one yolk for the three eggs. That helps to lower your uh, egg yolk intake if you cannot get rid of it altogether. And of course, when you're making those eggs, uh, please do not use butter, do not use margarine, do not use any kind of saturated fat. If the, um, if the oil is solid at room temperature, that's, an, I, that's a, a good sign that's a saturated fat and it's likely to increase your risk for heart disease. Um, I, I'm a big proponent of olive oil as well as avocado uh, oil. Avocado oil has a higher uh, burning point, so you don't burn it off like you oftentimes see with olive oil. If you have it in the pan too long, you'll see you know, smoke coming off it, and that doesn't taste very good. Um, so I think those are all the questions that we have here in the uh, chat box. Unless, John, do you see any other questions that I might have missed? Nope, that's everything. But um, I just wanted to thank you again for your very informative presentation, and thank you for everybody joining um, if anybody has any additional questions, you can email them off to Mather Hospital at northwell.edu. Um, I'd again like to thank you all for joining. And if you'd like to view past Healthy U webinars, you can see them at www.matherhospital.org forward slash Healthy U. Um, thank you again, uh, Dr. Shenouda, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Stay healthy. Be well. Bye-bye.